so we are live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are live now okay good evening everyone hope you are all enjoying the fellowship i think this is the fourth or fifth class am i right yeah good this week we are going to talk on valgusni which is entirely a, a different uh, kettle uh, varasni is our bread and butter every day we operate many varasnis but valgus knee is a bit of a, a difficult knee and especially fixed valgus is a bit difficult there are many ways to deal with valgus knee uh, but and the valgus comes with rheumatoids mostly and that also adds to the complexity so everyone whoever is doing the joint replacement surgery should be well versed with valgus knee because valgus knee has got some associated complications like patella maltracking and common peroneal palsy these two are very much associated with valgus knee correction so today we got a two senior uh, uh, faculty dr vivian prasad and dr suhas both of them are going to take you through the valgus knee and again let it be very interactive keep asking the questions and uh, uh, interrupt us or put the things in chat box and uh, in fact suhas came to the singapore hospital yesterday only for the sake of you guys he got the recording done Actually, we had a valgus knee, and uh, which is a very challenging knee. A rheumatoid guy who is in his early thirties, crippled for the last ten years. So we operated on his uh, valgus knee and corrected him. So good. So off uh, to the faculty. So who is going first, Suhas? Vivian? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Dr. Vivian will first uh, talk about uh, the basics and the brief principles of how to take care of a valgus knee. and then in my talk i'll go yeah. uh, slightly more into detail uh, and uh, hopefully back uh, everything with uh, a video so that they do understand what actually yeah. happens so off right, to good. dr vivian vivian prasad sir uh, uh, can i just give a intro to vivian sir so that oh, everybody know yeah he's standing hmm. boss hmm. can you just give a intro to vivian sir for all our fellows oh yeah vivian ah oh, yes sir so good evening everyone yeah, one minute sir I sir what did you tell you sir introduce one minute sir i think he logged out so you can do it others okay so uh, hi everyone so you are you should be you are very lucky to have vivian prasad sir with us today he is our senior most member of sunshine bone and joint institute uh he was an hrd at nims and uh, he is a professor and many 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 people have been trained by him in hyderabad outside of hyderabad he is an examiner and uh, i think he was a very strict examiner in the past i don't know about that but we are very happy and glad and fortunate to have him with us he he has a very voracious appetite for learning at his age also he still comes with so much of excitement for every case in the uh, ot and he has lots and lots of knowledge to give so Glad to have you with us, uh, Vivian sir, and please take it away. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adas, for your affectionate and good words about me. Now, I am going to talk on valgus knee. Basically, this has been presenting in a two talks. This present talk, which I am going to give, will be going basics and also some extent of uh, schematic diagrams to understand the principles. Next talk will be a videography and little bit advanced techniques by my other colleague, Dr. Sohas. so i am going to talk first valgus knee uh what is valgus deformity usually the normal anatomical angle between femur and tibia is about 5 to 7 degrees 5 5 to 7 degrees some people may have varus also little bit but in normal that is the angle if it is more than 10 degrees of valgus then it is called valgus deformity what is peculiarity of this valgus deformity is number 1 it is more challenging than varus deformity and more structures are involved in a complicated way finally the incidence is less so familiarity also less so that if you want to see and learn a high volume centers like our center or sunshen center like the centers these cases will be seen more often and we can learn more about this valgus deformity about coming to the incidence among the total number of tkas probably 10 to 17% of tkas may be having this valgus problem and uh, it is more common in females 
uh, coming to the causes, maybe osteoarthritis, next comes rheumatoid arthritis. Probably rheumatoid arthritis is the most common with this type of deformity. Then previous trauma with the condyle fractures and malunion, previous H2O, renal osteodystrophy with weakening of the bones and finer rickets. These are the etiological factors for this particular deformity. Coming to the pathoanatomy, the first four are telling something about bone and lower three are something about soft tissues. Coming to the bone pathology, femoral condyle is hypoplasia, both in two directions, both uh, anterior posteriorly and also longitudinally. The femoral, lateral femoral condyle will be hypoplasia. And uh, lateral tibial condyle are changes, a crater like thing will form in the center as if the lateral femoral condyle will be going on eroding. It forms a small gutter like thing in the lateral condyle. So these two changes will occur femur and also in the tibia. And also certain metaphyseal changes also can occur. And finally, petal or mal alignment also is one of the features. These are the bone problems. Coming to the soft tissues, lateral soft tissue contracture is one of the hallmark of valgus deformity. Iliotibial band, lateral capsule, popliteus, lateral collateral ligament, and lateral muscles, head of the gastronomus. All these things may be conducted. And another important point, one side, these are all contracted structures. Other side is medial soft tissue, medial ligament laxity. These are very important in the management and the surgical procedure and also selection of the implant. So physical examination is, is very important. And first of all, we have to quantify how much the deformity is correctable and both in extension and flexion, that has to be noted correctly. Especially after giving anesthesia also, I would like to advise to uh, examine the patient so that how much correction we are getting. Then assess the stability of the joint, especially medial collateral ligament laxity, and then patellofemoral tracking, and also evaluate the action side mechanism. Here I would like to tell you one important point. This type of valgus deformity can occur in two forms. One is with hyper extension of the knee joint. Another one is fixed deformity, fixed flexion deformity. We have to distinguish these two things because surgical procedures may be a little bit differ in both things. So identifying them both at the OP and also OT after anesthesia is very important. Of course, document and of documentation of the neurovascular structures, especially we have to exclude the food drop because severe valgus deformity may sometimes cause some problem and also better to document it in a case file so that you will not have any medical legal issues after surgery. Imaging, of course, uh, standing AP lateral, standing full length, skyline views, and valgus and varus testes, all these things are very important. Of course, CT scan sometimes to assess the bone defects. So these are the imaging things which we are doing regularly, and usually it will give the correct assessment of the deformity and bone mass. Of course, coming to the classification, a simple and very practical one is Ranawat classification. According to him, he has been made into class 1, class 2, class 3. Class 1 is 80% of the valgus knees comes under this. Usually, the deformity is less than 10 degrees. Of course, in my definition, I told 10 degrees, but just 10 degrees or something like that. And medial collateral ligament is intact. Whereas, class 2 may form another 15%. Here, the deformity will be 10 to 20 degrees. And uh, here, medial collateral ligament is there at end points. It is from end points, but it is a little bit attenuated. Whereas class 3, which will form about 5% of total cases, maybe more than 20 degrees of valgus deformity, either absent or severely attenuated medial collateral ligament. So this is the classification given by Ranawa. Of course, two classification also there, which is a little bit uh, more informative, maybe type 1, where the deformity can be corrected, but medial collateral ligament is intact. Type 2, where deformity can be corrected, but medial collateral ligament is intact. Between type 1 and type 2, the deformity is correctable or not correctable. Whereas type 3, deformity is correctable, but medial collateral ligament is a little bit attenuated. Whereas type 4, deformity cannot be corrected, and medial collateral ligament also a deficit. So type 4 is a very difficult one to treat. He more elaborated uh, the type 2 of Ranavat, as a two and three, so that we should know the deformity versus medial collateral ligament laxity. That is how the valgus deformity is being classified. Of course, approaches usually in our institute actually have been seen several times in medial para petalar approach. Still, that is a hallmark. 
The advantage of this medial petal, parapetal approach is, is a standard approach. Petal or dislocation is, dislocation is very easy. We are more familiar with it. Only disadvantage is more difficult to reach the postulateral corner where important structures, contracted structures are there, where we have to release them. That is one thing. Second thing is a petal or vascular damage may be there. These are all well described in the references given below. Lateral parapetal approach, of course, it is a little bit new one or not very familiar with all of us. But still recently we have done that approach. One of my colleagues, Dr. Kushal, has done it. Slowly we are seeing this also. Here the advantage of this lateral petal or approach is better visualization of the lateral tissues which are contracted so that we can do a correct job. Second one is petal or vascularization will not be compromised. Whereas disadvantage is difficulty in petal or reversion because middle side things are a little bit difficult to push it. And the less familiarity are with surgeons. This is very, very important. Most of us are familiar with middle petal or whereas lateral petal or is new. So if you are familiar with it, probably this is also a very good uh, approach for correction of the vulgar sneak. Of course, this is just paperwork with somebody, a nice paper where total knee orthoplasty in valgus knee, comparison of standard medial petal or medial parapetal or approach with the tibial tubercle osteotomy. Of course, there is not much difference in this course. Actually, tibial tuberosity osteotomy is very rarely done. Long back, I went to UK, one surgeon in Huntington, he was, he was doing the same thing even for revisions and valgus osteotomy. Probably that can be practiced with the, that surgeon who is very much familiar with it. But the results are almost same. In the same way, lateral or medial approach for valgus knee in total orthoplasty, there is one paper, which is better. Here, he it is being mentioned in that particular paper. Uh, there, he it is being mentioned, uh, concluded, lateral approach is safer and gives better results than medial approach. But at the end, he also telling, in the hands of surgeons who are familiar with it. So we have to get a surgeon who is very familiar with it so that he will do a good job. So our routine horse, workhorse is middle petal approach. We should not forget it. Then lateral approach, just a few points when we can take it or when we can consider. Recently, we have done it. Usually, when the surgical valgus is more than 20 degrees, pre-operative petal or mal tracking, dysplastic valgus deformity, Posterior lateral bone defects and valgus deformity with fixed reflection deformity. Already I told you in the clinical examination, fixed reflection deformity is difficult one to do. Probably this lateral approach can be considered. Then comes the main principle of how to balance this type of valgus, valgus deformity. There is a runaway balancing technique in which first you have to release the PCL. Usually the deformity is not much. We can do it like a primary TKR using even CR also we can do it. But if the deformity is more than 10 degrees, there comes the first step is PCL cut and the tibial cut has to be done first. That is very important. PCL release and tibial cut along with distal femoral cut so that when you cut the distal femur and proximal tibia will come across the extension gap. It has to be balanced properly by proper releases. Then go to the flexion gap and flexion gap Balancing is done by adjusting the femoral rotation. These principles I'll be showing in a schematic diagram and further it will be elaborated by Dr. Suhas in his talk. You can see a tibial cut, it is usual extra rigid, standard technique, 90 degrees of tibial axis, which are shown very nicely in the X-ray and also in the jig photograph. Then bone cuts in the femoral, the femoral distal cut, this is very important. Usually, when you think about valgus cut, sometimes we'll have some doubt whether to cut the femur in valgus or varum. But usually, the standard teaching is don't do the femoral varus cut at all. Usually, medullary entry points will be a little bit medial, and three degrees is the minimum valgus we have to cut the distal. That means three degrees of valgus we have to adjust and cut the distal cut at three degrees only, never in varus. That is very important. And regular intramedullary jig can be used. Here we have to have one idea about medial collateral ligament laxity. If it is very lax, better to cut lesser amount of resection. Here also I want to caution you, if it is hyperextension, better to do the distal cut less, not as usual nine, instead of that we can do seven, seven millimeters of cut. Like that we have to adjust depending upon the operative laxity of the joint. We have to be very careful about this. Then soft tissue releases, no conscience are there, we have to do only this is uh, or that that is not there. 
But certain important points are osteophyte removal is a must and the different sequences are reported. Plan to balance first extension gap followed by flexion gap, which I have already shown in my previous slides. Here, stretch the contracted lateral structures or release the lateral structures, which is equivalent to the length of the middle structures. That means middle side stiffness should be balanced with the lateral side tissue releases. So both middle and lateral has to be balanced well. If the middle is very much lax and very much attenuated, what to be done? I will be discussing later slides. Here, this is just a schematic diagram of different ligaments which has to be released. Further, they will be elaborated in next slides. Here, there are sequence of releases, insol, Krapo, Laskin. So many people are described so many things. Probably we are following Ranamak technique in which uh, first one to release is the PCL, then posterior capsule, then ITB pie cresting. And with that, most of the times, the correction will get it and surgery will, will go well. Sometimes, rarely we require LCL, lateral collateral ligament and popliteal ligament release. Very rarely, to tell frankly, I have not seen release of them in recent days. But we have to keep that also in the mind in the event of... Oh, actually, once I have seen a lateral collateral ligament in the very severe virus deformity, where everything released, but still virus deformity is there. This is an exceptional thing, just I am mentioning for uh, noting theoretical aspect. Here, just run out, so inside out technique, you can see on the diagram, we have to stretch it nicely with the extractors and nicely we have to release the posterior capsule and also elatable band or we can do the pie cresting which, uh, which we are showing here. We should be very careful about perial nerve when you are doing this procedure. I will be telling the anatomy in the next slide. You can see the anatomical location of the perial nerve. When you are doing pie cresting, we should have idea. The mean nerve the mean distance from the nerve to bone is about 1.49 centimeters. That means one and a half centimeters in adult. So anyhow, we should be very careful about that. And prior casting release should be done with carefully keeping this in mind. We have to release properly and do it properly. This again will be showing in a video. This is a very important step. Here, how to do the bone cuts, femoral AP cut, especially posterior cut, we have to be very careful. Here you can see, this is the posterior cut anterior posterior G, this is the line. Here you can see already tibia is cut nicely, perpendicular to lang axis, this is the thing. We have to keep this jig parallel to this, for which what we have to do is draw with cartery one line, parallel to this tibial cut line, then put that jig. Actually, I am very much thankful to our AVJR sir, Gorad sir, he has shown this technique when there is a little bit confusion of these cuts, but now it is very clear Keep the jig like that so that you will balance the flexion gap perfectly and accurately. Of course, uh, what will happen if you release the uh, lateral collateral ligament when there is very severe valgus deformity? If you release lateral collateral ligament and popliteal yes, tendon, they have been reported 24% of instability. So, better the essence of this slide or the essence of this work is not to do it as far as possible. In that, I haven't, if the very severe valgus, you don't want to touch the HCL and popliteal ligament. What next is the lateral epicondylar osteotomy being described? Anyhow, this also very rarely done. Just I am telling some in that situation, it is also another tool in the hands of the surgeon. In the lateral collateral ligament, basic surgery, basic point, basic principle is lateral. Yeah, we are losing sir's voice. Without disturbing it, both in extension and flexion. And okay. it needs this fixation more distally and posteriorly. So that so we, so we lost you uh, in the last two minutes. So if you can this same please, slide, please. can you repeat it? LEC osteotomy. Yeah, you can just start off from this slide. Can I tell now? Are you am yes. I aware article now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, just I am showing lateral epicondyle, maybe as a substitute for release of lateral collateral ligament, popliteal ligament. We can see like this lateral collateral ligament, lateral epicondyl osteotomy can be done. And this will relax the both the lateral collateral ligament and popliteal tendon. And here we have to fix this after osteotomy more the distally and posteriorly so that the lateral collateral ligament and popliteal ligament will be laxed. And again, we have to balance this after release, fix with the KY and balance both flexion extension, then fix with the screw so that deformity is corrected. 
that is the essence of this particular lateral epicondral osteotomy. In severe valgus, most important thing is medial collateral ligament status. Here, this is very important. That is going to dictate. It is the medial laxity, but not the valgus angle. Even valgus angle is more. Medial laxity is important. That is going to dictate our use of either constant or not constant implant. In this, if the medial collateral ligament is intact, probably we can man man manage with primary implants like PS. But if it is stretched, constraint like LCCK or TC3 or MCL procedures may be required. If it is ineffective, probably we have to go for a hinge process. This is a severe valgus deformity in which we are doing a medial collateral reefing, or you can see here, like this, you can detach the medial collateral ligament attachment along with the bone stock, put, his, put it more proximally and also more laterally so that the ligament is stretched. That is how we can do it. This is the medial reefing. Like this, you can be reefed just overlapping edges. But these procedures usually we have to learn or we can take the help of our arthroscopic colleagues so that we can get a correct intact medial collateral ligament. But be prepared with this when you are undertaking a severe valgus deformity. Then comes the constant implants, either LCCK or TC3. Usually they are required in surgical valgus more than 10 degrees, MCL insufficiency. That means insufficient, but there is their MCL, but it is insufficient, not completely lost. And also dysplastic rigid valgus also sometimes required large bone defects. Here you can see this diagram. This is the normal PS, post to stabilize. There's some gap and some amount of laxity is there. Can, the post can move here. Whereas in LCCK, the, there are stuck nicely between post and cam so that no movement will occur. Some extent, they will take care about the insufficiency of the medial collateral ligament so that joint will be stable. These are the, again, I hope this will be shown in one of our videos next. Then hinge, when you have to use the hinge. Usually hinge we have to use in an elderly patient with a multi-ligament or severe ligament laxity, osteoporotic bones, multi-planar instability, major bone defects, hyper laxity, severe valgus deformities, rheumatoid arthritis. In the situation, we have to use, we have to prepare with the cemented stems also in difficult, just like difficult uh, extra picture showing severe valgus deformity, medial opening, how it is being nicely corrected with the stems, use of stems under this uh, hinge. This is a rotated platform type of hinge. Petrolo femoral joint. This is another uh, problem which is associated with the valgus deformity. Petrol or maltracking is sometimes will be seen. Actually, some cases of very severe uh, valgus, more than 50, 60 degrees, long back in Nizams, I have to do two, two stage procedure. Now may not be accepted, may not be required. At that time, I have to do a separate insertion, release of the petrolla, then do the TKR after three or four weeks later. That, of course, that is described in standard textbooks, but not a routine procedure. Just I'm telling for the theory's sake. But due to tight lateral structures, petrolofemoral may be dislocated or may be sublocated. Most important point is osteophytectomy and partial resection. In your institute, we are nicely shaping the petrolla with the saw so that it will become a round and nice structure. Usually we are not doing petal replacement, but if you are planning to do petal replacement, it has to be implanted a little bit laterally so that uh, it will be stable. And the petal of femoral tracking may need a lateral retinal release sometimes. And uh, very rarely tibial, tibial tuberosity transfer. This lawyer mentioned two processes are rarely done. And uh, just you have to keep it in mind, be prepared for it with wiring and screws, if at all it is required. The complications in this particular surgery in a TKR in valgus, maybe revision rates uh, 0 to 7%, petal arm attacking 2 to 10%, soft tissue laxity, perennial palsy, wound, wound healing issues, recurrent residual valgus. Any of these things are very, maybe occurring in a uh, class 3 where severe deformities, usually in a mild one, 85% of the cases, these are not very much seen. So just we have to know these problems, especially perineal replants, you have to keep it in mind and we have to be careful about it. So conclusions, the management of valgus knee is different from that of the varus knee. 
understanding of the patho anatomy and recognize the indications for various factors is need to get the good results. You should know what is exactly happening and plan your surgery. And intraoperatively also, we have to assess and do the proper job. Following a simple but definitive, definitive algorithm is definitely helps. And avoid going for a higher constraint, better not to go higher constraint rather than correct it by soft tissue balance. That is one thing. Of course, with our robo, we have been able to do a little bit more balancing better way. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. So, any questions for Vibian, sir? Anybody wants to ask anything, wants to add any points from our faculty? <coughs> Very good presentation, Vibian, sir. Thank you. Very sir. nicely tackled. Yeah, any uh, chat box, Kishore? <coughs> Kishore? No nothing chat box. Nothing, nothing, nothing at the moment. Mm. Mm, okay. Right. So, us. So, boss, you want to introduce really? Suhas, sir, once to the delegates? Yeah. Suhas already was introduced last time. I think Suhas is one of our, again, very senior uh, faculty members. He was trained in America and he is one of our uh, forefront uh, research guys and he does a lot of robotic surgeries. So, he's uh, one of our most valuable faculty members. He got a very clarity of thought and uh, here he is there to teach you about the valgus, really, what do you do in the ground? To us. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, Dr. Vibian uh, very eloquently took you through uh, various aspects of how a valgus knee has to be managed. Now we will get down to a little more specifics so that we have more clarity on what we should do at every step. Uh, Surgery is a consequence of uh, all the decisions that you make. So every step uh, of uh, the surgery, you have to take a call and make a decision. And unfortunately, in total knee, uh, you take a wrong step, then it just becomes a slippery slope. Uh, it's very difficult to come back and uh, bring the back, uh, bring the patient back to a, a decent uh, uh, in terms of uh, both stability as well as alignment. So uh, I will give you every step of surgery and how to tackle each of these and then substantiate each step with uh, a video presentation. So Dr. Vibian has already told you about all the clinical considerations that you have to take. Uh, he went through various classifications. Uh, if you look at all the classifications or any clinical or radiological assessment, essentially we need five or six things uh, about the pathology before you go in for surgery. Number one, uh, where is the deformity coming from? Is it just bone or is it bone and soft tissue? Whether it is intra-articular or extra-articular. So a lot of this information comes from radiographs. Clinically, you want to know whether it is correctable or not, whether the, whether the MCL is competent or not, whether there is associated FFD or hyperextension. Hyperextension typically happens in an osteoarthritic setting. And FFD happens more in terms of uh, rheumatoid arthritis setting. So that you need to understand. If you have severe hypoplasia of uh, the lateral aspect, you can have patellar maltracking. Very important to know because what approach to take is based on this. Sometimes you can have a partially subluxed uh, patella. And in some very severe cases, you have a patella that is dislocated and lying on the side for more than five to six years. The other considerations, which are minor but very important, is whether the patient has a flat foot or not with uh, incompetence or competence of the tibialis posterior. And then CPN for sure, because uh, medical legally also it is important that you document whether the CPN is functioning or not. And also in patients who have severe deformity, you have to give them a guarded prognosis and tell them you might end up with some neuropraxia uh, which usually recovers post-surgery. So warning the patients and the relatives that this is a known established complication is also important. Uh, so decision-making, I've split that into these subtypes. How do you decide what approach to take? How do you take your tibial cut? How do you prepare your femur? 
once you have soft tissue tightness on the lateral side, what is the order of your release? Uh, subsequently, what implant selection you have to do, which is a decision, which is an ongoing process. And then some of the rarer procedures that we need to do, like a condylar osteotomy or a retinacular release. What are the indications and how are these actually done? So here we have a, a clinical case, which was recently operated, uh, both bilateral uh, staggered uh, was done in this patient. So we've discussed all our clinical considerations. So as the patient walks and we do the physical exam, uh, let us see whether we are getting all the important information we need from this patient or not. So this is a 37 year old rheumatoid uh, gentleman uh, with severe deformity, more on the right as compared to the left. This valgus stress, we are checking the competence of the MCL, which is intact. And this knee is partially correctable. The left is little less severe, but again, MCL is competent and you have some correction. Uh, there is no FFD, fortunately, though this is a rheumatoid, but you have some amount of hyperextension and the range of motion is reasonable. And then you can also see the patellar tracking was also fine. The right side was already, already operated using the lateral approach. Uh, what I'm going to present to you is the medial side. This is on table and you can see that there is some amount of hyperextension and the tibia has subluxed posteriorly. So now, how do you decide between medial and lateral? As it has been emphasized, medial is your workhorse because of the familiarity of the approach. Uh, you can most of the time use medial except for three situations. If you have a severe deformity of more than 20 degrees, which is uncorrectable, the knee is stiff and the patella is maltracking. So I'll repeat that again. If you have a fixed valgus deformity of more than 20, where the knee is stiff and the patella is maltracking. Okay. Now there are reasons for this. Uh, medial side, uh, the release on the lateral side is a little more difficult because the approach uh, you'll have to really go underneath and try to visualize these structures. Uh, and there is only one disadvantage of medial approach, which surgeons using lateral approach keep quoting. Uh, you've already done your medial patellar uh, parapatellar arthrotomy. And now for the patellofemoral uh, mechanics, if you have to do a lateral release and you injure the superior geniculate artery, you essentially have a patella with uh, not much blood supply left. Clinically, this is less uh, important because over a period of four to five months, uh, the patella regains vascularity. But uh, this is something that you have to keep in mind that medially, if you open the joint and you also have to do a lateral release, then you are subjecting the patella to decreased blood supply. But what are the advantages of going lateral? Uh, lateral, as I said, it is more for patients who have very severe deformity. So here, as you do the arthrotomy, you're already doing your retinacular release, right? Lateral retinaculum is already released. Number two, you're addressing the pathology where it is, and uh, you have the ability to release the IT band from the Gerdes tubercle. So this is a very strong release. By crusting the IT band versus trying to raise it from the Gerdes tubercle is, is a big difference. So when you have severe deformities and you want to have good correction right away, uh, releasing it from the Gerdes tubercle is what you should do. Third advantage is the lateral condylar slide or the osteotomy that you have to do. Again, you have better visualization. And patellofemoral kinematics are obviously better maintained because the laterally sublux patella can come back onto the trochlear group. But what are the problems? It is less familiar, more disorienting because we are so used to doing medial, we're so used to dislocating the fem uh, the tibia by external rotation. You here you have to do the opposite. Um, in terms of um, tibial preparation, we are so used to externally rotating. Here you have to internally rotate. So it does beg uh, some familiarity, which can only come with time. So it is best learned uh, with somebody who normally does it and then go back and slowly you can try one after the other. Uh, the other problems is uh, either it has to be uh, done along with a quadriceps snip or a tibial tubercle osteotomy. The reason is, again, because of the stiffness, you have to flex these knees, you have to move the quadriceps and the TTO away. Uh, now, how do you decide between snip and TTO? 
TTO is done when you have patella baha uh, and you have a lot of uh, uh, scarring underneath the patella like in case uh, of uh, post HTO situation. Uh, and uh, you can move the tibia tubercle uh, osteotomized fragment up and medial or lateral in order to help you with the patellofemoral kinematics as well as rotation. So if you have these issues, uh, do it along with the TTO. But if only exposure is the problem, you have to do it along with the SNP. So at the end of the procedure, the main issue is the closure. Uh, when you do a medial parapatellar uh, arthrotomy, it's very easy to get the tissues back together and suture. But on the lateral side, getting these tissues back together becomes very difficult. And then you're, you're left with a rent, which can cause seepage of uh, the hematoma, uh, as well as it can cause uh, skin issues uh, more often than not. So you need to remember this. So here I'll show you the fir first, I'll show you the medial parapetellar approach, and then we'll move on to a video of the lateral parapetellar. Medial approach, uh, run of the mill, very standard. All that you have to remember is make sure you don't uh, do too much medial release, which you're so used to doing on a barrest knee because here uh, we've already said that uh, the medial structures are already incompetent. Removal of the osteophytes, again, have to happen both on the medial as well as the lateral and lateral key both on the femur as well as the tibia. So let me just start this video. So here, post anesthesia, maybe some hyperextension more than what it was. So just a standard uh, medial incision and then the medial parapatellar arthrotomy. Uh, for, for some reason, the tunica just didn't work in this patient. So the field is a little bloody. I apologize for that. So here you can see medially, I'm not doing much release. I'm just doing enough so that I can just dislocate my femur. Okay. Now coming to the, the lateral side, um, we did the right side using uh, uh, the lateral uh, parapetlar approach, uh, but some parts of uh, the surgery which need good explanation, we could not capture during surgery. So I'm uh, taking the liberty of using uh, a video of uh, Dr. Brian Parsley, uh, who's uh, shown this so beautiful. Uh, and once you start the video, you need to understand that the incision is slightly more lateral as compared to medial parapetilla. And we don't do a uh, lateral arthrotomy like we do on the medial side. What we have to do is called Z-plasty. That means uh, after you incise, you lengthen the tissue so that closure becomes easy. Uh, the third step that you will see is release of the IT band from the Gerdes tubercle. And then you'll have to internally rotate to dislocate the, the femur. If you have any questions, uh, understanding the principle of lateral parapetular approach is very important. So I'll just start playing the video and describe what's happening here. So here he is uh, showing a case which we typically describe, uh, uncorrectable, very tight, stiff knee. So instead of a uh, medial incision, he is slightly more lateral in this particular patient. And then uh, he will show the, the Z plasty. So the medial side, we haven't done anything. Laterally, we've opened. And here is the quadriceps followed by the, this is the patella. And this is the patella tendon. So go as lateral as you can. It all depends on how much is the deformity. And we will open this in two layers. So here you can see he's incising the retinaculum right from the top to bottom. But we are not going and opening the joint inside. We're only releasing the retinaculum. So use the belly of the blade so that you just do this release. And then you can see the capsule and uh, is still intact. So we are only releasing the lateral retinaculum. And this is in continuity with your patella and the patella tendon. Once this is done, this flap has to be raised. So now you can see the joint is still not open. You're just releasing the lateral retinaculum from the capsule and you're raising a flap. And you start raising this till you reach the patella. Okay, so you're basically double press. You're just opening up. Now, once you have raised the lateral retinacular flap, now you do your arthrotomy, which is just the capsule. So now you have a situation where uh, this is the one edge of the retinaculum. This is the other edge. You went underneath, released the capsule, 
And now when you suture, you will suture the edge of the retinaculum to the edge of the capsule. So that's how you have elongated the uh, lateral side. So is that clear? So here you can see you do the uh, release of the IT band from the Gerdes tubercles. See how powerful uh, this release is. You just go laterally deep inside and you release everything. Um, uh, I can play the video if you have any questions or any doubts. If it's clear, we can move forward. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Kota Aditya is asking jet plastic. They wanted to know about jet plastic. So this is jet plastic where uh, I'll show you another diagram uh, to explain it further. Exact plastic... location, exact location for that lateral retinal release. Uh, yeah, so, distance from little border. So that depends on the degree of deformity you have. Yeah. If you have a very severe deformity, you go as far lateral as possible. Mm -hmm. If you have a little milder, then you can go closer to the patella. But since it's already a given that you're dealing with uh, very bad deformities, uh, it makes sense that you, uh, if this is the patella, come down as further as possible to do the release on this side. So Z plasty is when you cut them in two layers, extend them, and then suture them. So that's how you're increasing the length. So in the next video, uh, I'll show you how this uh, is closed. So now closure is also equally important because we've said uh, airtight closure is the problem. Uh, so here what we use is now this procedure is done. You can see the implant is in C2. Here you have the capsule. Here we normally on the medial side, what we do is we excise all this fat pad and the synovium that we have. But here it is very important that you preserve this. And then you start doing your sutures on the inferior side because this is where the rent will appear. So sealing this part is also very important. So use the fat, use whatever soft tissue you have to get good closure here. So once this is done, then you can start doing interrupted sutures here and then put a continuous layer. Some surgeons even use an anchor here where uh, over the anchor, they try to uh, get both tissues together in order to get a watertight closure. And a lot of surgeons are hesitant to do this approach precisely because of this reason, where you end up with a good surgery, but you don't end up with a good closure. And then it becomes a problem. And uh, on the proximal side, you have to do a figure of eight stitch on uh, the rectus with the vastus lateralis. So here I have another diagram which clearly explains what I just showed you. This is the retinacular layer. This is the capsule. First you go down, release the retinaculum as further down as much as you can, raise that flap. And after you raise the flap, you incise through the capsule closer to the patella. And now you suture this tip to this tip. So this is your elongation. Here you have a picture. This edge should have been sutured to this edge. But instead, we are suturing the retinaculum to the capsule, thus elongating this side. Okay. So conceptually, this is what lateral parapetular approach is. What you have to understand is it's a Z plasty where you're, elong you're elongating your tissues so that you're suturing the retinaculum to the capsule. If you don't do this and go uh, in, in one stroke, if you go through the retinaculum and the capsule, uh, closing this incision becomes very difficult. So now we've decided what approach to use, medial versus lateral. Lateral, I've already told you the indications. So now let's move forward with the surgery. Now, once you've dislocated the tibia, first thing you have to appreciate is on the medial side, you don't have wear, so this is higher. And on the lateral side, in this particular patient, you have wear, uh, which is little lower. So uh, first decision making, always cut your tibia at 90 degrees. Uh, in all these patients, it is important to you decide that. Number two, thickness of the cut. This thickness of the cut is based on whether you have hyperextension or you have an FFT. In all these cases, it is always wise to take a less cut. In this particular patient, I measured from the medial side, but I, but I only took a 4 mm cut uh, in order to make sure that my medial side doesn't become too lax. But I do end up with some gap here. So that is a decision that you have to take. 
always because medial side is more lax try to take less of the tibia at a 90 degree cut so that you will make sure that you, you don't create further laxity on the medial side you can always uh, do releases on the lateral in order to release that side so it's easier to open up a tight side as compared to trying to close a lax side okay and then slope again it's uh, we are uh, uh, tied up with the instrumentation that we have if you are using a cr you can use little more slope if you're using a ps you can use less slope but a standard slope if you can adjust is around three degrees and then never reverse slope because if you are already hyperextended and you give a reverse slope you will accentuate hyperextension so we'll just see these steps here so i'm showing you that medial side is higher lateral side is lower now we will uh, put our uh, jig the instrumentation is pfc in this case and you can see i'm measuring from the medial side and then i'm measuring 4 mm and then uh, i'm trying to decrease the slope little because i don't want too much slope once everything is in place uh, you take your cut So once the cut is done, you'll have to make sure that uh, you are uh, at 90 degrees. So here uh, you can see that you've taken the tibia and you've cut at 90. Any questions on uh, tibial preparation as of now? Thickness of cut from normal side is only for 4 mm, sir. In this particular case, if, if you have a uh, 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 little more tightness, Yes. And you uh, you have a good competent MCL, you can take little more. How can uh, we decide that? Uh, how much we should take? So what I would say is as a standard, if, if normally you take 9 mm, you start off taking either 7 or 6 in most of your patients. Because you can always go back and cut more. Yes. But if you, if you already cut 9 and you take a big chunk of bone from the middle side, then uh, it's a losing battle. So there is wisdom in taking less. Uh, in this particular patient, because it was rheumatoid and things like that, I took four. I could have even taken four or five. But again, you start increasing the thickness of the poly. So as a standard, take a minus two or a minus four cut just to begin with. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So now uh, we're done with that. Now comes the femur. So here you can see... Uh, the things that to, you need to note is where should be the entry point, number one. Number two, what should be your, your valgus uh, correction angle. Uh, and third, if you have hyperextension, what you need to do. So what you typically should understand is it is not uh, uh, represented in this particular case, case, but this side is hypoplastic. Because this side is hypoplastic, what you see as the center of the canal is not the center. It is more lateral. So in all valgus knees, after you draw your white sides line, you have to take your entry slightly more medial, which is actually in line with the center of the femur. So entry point has to be slightly more medial. So that's the first thing you need to understand. Second thing is valgus correction angle. Uh, uh, we make a big deal out of this. Uh, uh, for a varus or a va for a varus knee, it might it's not that important, but for a valgus knee, it is. Uh, and this is again a surgeon's choice. Uh, do you want to uh, leave a patient, uh, a valgus patient, in some amount of valgus at the end of surgery, or do you want to overcorrect them into varus? There are two schools of thought. If you overcorrect and put them into varus, or uh, overcorrect from say uh, from five degrees to even three degrees. Uh, surgeons who favor uh, favor it because you are making sure that the medial side doesn't elongate when these patients walk. Right, uh, all these patients walk with a valgus thrust, and always the medial structures are in constant uh, tension. If you leave them in some valgus, they say that the medial side can elongate. The surgeons who don't like doing this say that if a patient normally has always walked all her life with a valgus gait, if you put them in varus, they will not like it. Okay, so both schools of thought are there. My recommendation is put it at five degrees, which is which is normal, 
but if you feel you need to slightly overcorrect this patient or the patient has a flat foot uh, flat foot with a valpoid gait again causes too much opening on the medial side so if my patient has a flat foot and uh, she is slightly obese meaning the medial sides might rub a little i would decrease the valgus correction angle to 3 otherwise standard use 5 if you have a hyperextension deformity again take a minus 2 or a minus 4 cut so let us see that uh, in this particular video so i am trying to remove all the osteophytes from the lateral side mark your white sides line and in this case um, i am not that medial because i don't have much hypoplasia of this side so once i have entered the second thing to note is uh, because of uh, the lateral condyle hypoplasia you should have a gap here in this case it is not but i'll show you uh, a picture where that happens and i'll tell you what to do uh, in such situation so here we've just taken a distal cut so once that is done so normally this is what you will see this is the lateral this is the medial when you enter um, you will touch on the medial side but on the lateral side you have some gap here again if you increase your valgus angle you will decrease this gap from 3 to 5 this gap can decrease but the best thing would be to keep it at 5 see what is the distance if distance is more than 4 mm then you need to use an augment if you have less than 4 mm uh, we have had situations where we have used uh, just two screws with some cement over it uh, but resist the temptation of taking a further cut in order to decrease this space if the patient has hyperextension if the patient has an ffd and you might need further cut you can take a plus 2 cut where this distance decreases but in general principles uh, apply if you have less than 4 you can use screws and cement but if you have more than 4 you can use an augment but in terms of uh, Uh, the angulation either select 3 or 5 uh take a minus cut in hyperextension and a plus cut if you have a severe ffd so now this is done now once you've taken your distal femur cut as well as the tibial cut remember varus uh is a deformity where the problem is both in flexion and extension but valgus uh is a problem of extension flexion is usually pretty solid and it is balanced well the problem is mainly in extension so in this patient after taking the cuts this is an 8 mm spacer and then you will see when i give a valgus force the medial is opening up 1 or 2 mm which is acceptable but lateral was just too tight it was just not opening so here you can see medial is opening 1 or 2 mm that is good but lateral is too tight and i could feel the structures were too tight so you have some amount of lateral tightness versus uh, the medial laxity so uh, here we decided that we will do some amount of soft tissue releases now comes uh, the question of uh, what soft tissue releases to do and how to do it so this is how you would have a situation where your medial is loose and your lateral is tight okay so now dr vivian has shown you this picture uh, if you look at all the authors they are all big stalwarts and uh, they they have contributed to arthroplasty a lot but if you can see in the beginning uh, somebody like insol uh, they recommended doing lateral collateral as well as popliteus but now we know that these two are the most important structures for lateral stability so we have almost done away by uh, in terms of trying to release the lateral collateral and popliteus that's why i highlighted everything in yellow we are not doing this what is most commonly done and what is recommended as of now today is the ranavat technique where for an extension deformity we concentrate on posterior lateral corner and the it band and we always try to save the popliteus and the lateral collateral ligament so we are only talking about four structures you are talking about posterior lateral corner you are talking about it band you are talking about popliteus and you're talking about lateral collateral ligament out of these four structures you need to preserve two which is lateral collateral ligament and the popliteus the two structures that you will address uh, in terms of correcting the lateral side is 
the posterolateral corner as well as the IT band. Okay, is that clear? This is very important for you to understand. Yes. So now this is the triangle that we all keep speaking. So I have put one uh, line diagram as well as one uh, picture from the surgery. So this triangle is guarded by three structures. You know, you're looking at the lateral side. Uh, this is the cut surface of the tibia. This is your popliteus tendon. And this is your IT band. Okay. So what is marked in red is the posterolateral corner. This when initially described by Ranawat, they used to use a 50 number blade and make uh, these uh, incisions, which is just called pie crusting. But now we know uh, that you do have the uh, common peroneal nerve right here. So instead of doing it with a knife, now we do it with a cautery, which is set at 30 to 40 so that it's not uh, too aggressive, number one. And number two, since you use the cautery, if you have a twitch, you know you're too close to the nerve. So those are the two modifications that surgeons have done over a period of time. So here I have a video. So now, how do you decide between posterolateral corner release versus IT band release? Uh, surgeons who are very experienced uh, like to do the posterolateral corner and then come to IT band. You can always reverse them. There is no problem. Releasing the IT band is much simpler, much easier. So all you, whenever you begin, you can try to do that, except only in one situation. If you have lateral tightness along with that, if you have an FFD, which needs to get corrected, you have to release the posterolateral corner. Is that clear? Between these two structures, to open up your extension gap, you can address either addressing posterolateral corner. Surgeons are a little more conservative because you know the CPN is right behind it. But you have to do it in a situation where you have some FFT, which is residually left. So here you have a video where, uh, so before I start, so use a lamina spreader. You can do it either in flexion or extension. This is the popliteus here. This is your cut surface of the tibia. And this is your IT band. So I will feel for this right structure. And then using the long tip cautery, we will try to release that. So, so I'm, I'm doing that here. So you can see, this is the amount of opening. I've done some release. Now you feel for it, see whether the tension has dissipated. And now use the lamina spreader, little more medial, and you can see I'm able to open it a little more. See how much I could open it. So this is a very powerful release and you can see a rent that has been created there. So I'll just play this again. So here you have the popliteus. This is the cut surface of the tibia. This is the lateral border. Uh, by the way, this is not for this patient. This is a video from another patient that I already had. Uh, and then once you've created that rent, and then you can open and then you can see. The other tip that I would give you is, uh, you can see the cautery tip, right? Uh, this blue thing is a guard. So what you can do is you can cut the guard just 1.5 uh, uh, centimeters from the tip so that when you enter, if you're able to see some amount of the metal cautery tip, you know you're not beyond 1.5 centimeters. So you can set the guard such that when you're penetrating, if the blue is also gone through, that means you're too deep. So that can act as a guide for you when you're trying to decide how deep or how superficial you should be. Okay. So this is done. So this is just explaining the same thing again. So popliteus, tibia, use a cautery instead of uh, a knife, set at 30 to 40. And you know your CPN is too close. Now let's go to the other video where uh, I'll show you the IT band release, which we did in this patient because the release I needed was not too much. So here, this is the video of this particular patient. Uh, I initially put a lamina spreader, but the tibia was so weak that it was just, uh, it was almost like butter. The lamina spreader was just uh, going into the bone. So I didn't want to do much damage. This can be done with 11 number blade. And initially, I'll show you how to use the blade. So this is vertical and this is horizontal. So 
if if this is your it band if i go at 90 degrees i am giving a huge release versus going parallel so in this patient i don't i don't need much release so what i'll do is i'll align my plate in line with the fibers so that i don't do too much of release but if you have a very tight it band then you can twist your knife and go at 90 degree angle so i'm just depicting that here so here you can see so instead of going at 90 we are just going parallel to the fibers so you can nicely feel the tight structure uh, here again the other apprehension is are you going through lcl are you going through it band are you going through arcuate complex it is all one big structure okay so feel for it do multiple steps and then see what's happening so here now you can see i've changed from an 8 mm to a 10 mm shim and then you can see both medial laterally and i have one or two mm opening that means i'm balanced and then my leg is uh, in uh, it's not in hyper extension nor is it in fld so uh, i've shown you both how to do a posterior lateral corner release and how to do a it band release so once this is done practically most of your surgery is done now this is another uh, video not from this patient i have to acknowledge dr dhanshekar uh, for this video uh, if you do it band as well as posterior lateral corner and you have some amount of valgus residual deformity this is where you need to do a lateral condylar slide so this is a patient where uh, he's done a lateral uh, parapetular approach and then uh, we are uh, we'll show you how uh, lateral condylar osteotomy is done uh, the principles that you have to remember is never take a very small chunk because you need to fix it back so you almost take one third of the lateral condyle that's number one how do you decide that you have a flare of uh, the metaphyseal flare and it comes down so take it flush to that flare meaning you'd have to take a big chunk so here i'll start playing this video so uh, you can see we are almost removing one third of uh, the condyle so once the mark is made uh, so this is osteophyte so don't worry about this part uh, but you can appreciate so this is the projection from the flare right so you have to take that much so use a um, uh, sagittal saw and then it has to be complete so when you are uh, doing a osteotomy there are no half measures you have to take a full cut uh, and you have the popliteus as well as the lateral collateral attached to this okay so we've almost released it now now what is the idea the idea here if this is your femur if you have extension tightness if i remove my uh, lateral condyle i'll move it down so that my gap opens but if i have both flexion and extension i will move it distally and posteriorly so that is what you will see here so once you do the release you put your trials in and then you extend your knee so when you're extending your knee the uh, the tissues are so uh, pliable that it will always come and sit exactly where it has to you know in terms of overlap so here you can see that uh, it has moved down and then uh, so once it overlaps you know how much amount of bone you have to remove so you have to use an osteotome in uh, or a nibbler in this particular patient both flexion and extension were tight so now you are trying to remove uh, the posterior part and then for the distal part you can again use a cotley uh, and then mark how much amount of bone you have to remove so that you will see now so here you're cutting the distal i have already we have already removed the posterior now you're cutting distal uh, and then now you use a flexible uh, coker so that you can grip it and then here you can see how much correction you're getting see this is where it was and you've almost moved it uh, 7 to 8 mm and then you're also posteriorizing it so you put the uh, put the coker check your stability both in flexion and extension 
and uh, once you're happy you can uh, fix it usually two screws are enough uh, you can use a 4mm cancellous screw uh, or a cortical screw with a washer uh, both work uh, it is better you cement your whole implant and once that is done fix your osteotomy because you fix your osteotomy first and you in flexion extension or you cementing you might uh, cause some damage to the repair so best is to finish your cementation and then uh, come down to the osteotomy so if you have any further questions we can discuss after that so once your extension gap is done uh, rest is pretty simple here again uh, now we're doing the rest of the femur this is the transepicondylar axis and this is the white side line. we expect uh, that there is lateral condylar hypoplasia which is not there in this case so uh, the main thing that you need to remember here is uh, stay neutral to the TEA axis or some amount of external rotation because all valgus knees you're dealing with some amount of patellofemoral problems so if anything you need to slightly rotate more so that the patella tracks well uh, now if you have you will have two situations either your flexion gap is loose or your flexion gap is too tight you can make minor changes in terms of how you prepare your rest of the femur to either close the flexion gap or open the flexion gap remember we've already done our extension and it's balanced the problem only is with the flexion gap uh, in terms of steps i think the lateral condyle osteomatum came early but it's usually done in the end uh, just to show you sequence of how it's done i put it in uh, in front of preparing the femur but the condylar osteotomy is usually done in the end so here if your flexion gap is loose and you're using anterior referencing you can upsize you can use a bigger femur anterior referencing anterior cut is constant you use a bigger femur you stuff the posterior side if you're using posterior referencing you don't have that luxury so all that you have to do is you have to move the whole jig down okay if the flexion gap is tight uh, and if you somebody you're doing a CR you can remove uh, the PCL or this is the only situation where you have to picrus the popliteus you can't completely resect it but you can use a 60 number blade and then picrus the popliteus uh, even in the last uh, uh, I think uh, two or three sessions there's always been confusion about anterior referencing versus posterior referencing so i have a video of that so that you understand the difference so this is pfc and here we're showing anti-referencing this is smith and nephew here we're showing posterior referencing anterior referencing is where the anterior cut is constant the pins uh, or the pinhole moves with the posterior part of the, of the cheek so here you can see I'm fixing it. I fixed it at 2.5. So now you've fixed your anterior, right? Superior. Now I'm able to move my jig up and down. This will decide how much I have to cut from the posterior aspect. In this particular case, my gap was not too much. So I have fixed it at 2.5. But if I feel that my gap is too much, instead of using the 2.5 hole, I can put it at 3 so that i'm upsizing my femur as i upsize my femur i'm cutting less bone from the posterior so this is anti-referencing where the holes move with the posterior cut so here you can see that so if i move down i cut less if i move up i cut more so here i fix now in in contrast you see the smith and nephew jig where the holes are constant can you see these two holes are where you put your pins this distance between this holes and the posterior aspect is constant all that changes is the superior one so here this is posterior referencing where your posterior cut is constant and how much bone to cut you base it on the anterior measurement here you can't upsize or downsize to affect change in the posterior aspect which is flexion you can only move the whole jig so you you can see this screw here in uh, smith and nephew you can open this screw and move your holes up and down so every time 
uh, fellows ask, should we use anti-referencing? Should you use post-referencing? That is not more important. More important is for you to know which instrumentation has what and what versatility is there in that particular instrumentation. Like for example, here in Smith and View, I can open up that screw and move it up and down and uh, affect the favorable change that I need for surgery. Similarly, in anti-referencing, I can move it up and down. So this is off the topic, but uh, I just wanted to clear because a lot of you guys had doubts in this particular question. Okay, so now once this is done, uh, this is uh, just showing the lateral condylar hypoplasia, where if you use the posterior condyle, you will internally rotate your femur. So make sure that you don't do that. And uh, in this particular case, now once the cuts are done, here you can see just uh, we are just trialing. We are using a 10 mm poly in this patient. And then uh, once it is in place, you can see that uh, I'm good solid stability medial-laterally and uh, I'm dead uh, center. And then we go ahead uh, and do, do cementing in this particular patient. I think we can skip this particular slide. Okay, now the last video that I have is for patellar tracking. So we've, we've seen how to do PCL release. We've seen IT band. We've seen how an osteotomy is done. And now the only other thing that is left is the lateral uh, retinacular release. Okay, so this is medial and that's lateral. In this particular patient, even in our patient after uh, taking all precautions, there was still some maltracking. So you can see that it's not sitting in the groove and it is sitting on the side. So I'm just playing that again. So here you can do some lateral release. Again, this is very well described by uh, paper uh, by Dr. Maniar. Uh, there is a surgical video also. So the release uh, you can see here, Again, I'm not opening the whole capsule, okay? I'm only opening the retinaculum and you have to start distal. Do it next to the patella. After that is, uh, sorry, the patella tendon. After that, you go on to the uh, patella and then you go on to the quadriceps. The reason is the more proximal you go, the more chances of the superior geniculate artery getting compromised. So here, let me play that video again. So used to uh, Alice so that you can pull the patella into the center and then you start doing your release. So I almost start from here. So that's the next to the tendon and next to the um, patella. I needed some more release. So I just went a little more superior uh, and uh, released near the quadriceps. Usually there's sometimes there's a thread and now you can see that it's nicely sitting in the groove. So that's uh, how uh, you need to do. First step, closer to the tendon, next to the patella, next into the quadriceps. Okay, so, uh, so finally, uh, implant selection, right? So what is important here is, um, PS is overwhelmingly the most commonly implant used. But if you're somebody who is an exclusive CR surgeon, that then you can still use for SU type 1, type 2, and run our type 1. But the requisite is your MCL has to be functional, number one. And number two, your popliteus and your LCL have to be intact, and you should not have a flat foot. Okay. And then the other side of the story, which uh, Dr. Weben has already covered, if you have any neurological issue, when you have hyperextension, very important you rule out polio, you rule out any any neurological issue because if you do a regular knee in these patients, they will stretch out over a period of time and hyperextension comes back. So all neurological hyperextensions do a hinge. Major bone loss, if you have, you have to do a hinge. Severe valgus, like how I showed, where you almost released everything, suddenly everything opens up. And then that's the reason you need to have a higher constraint. In such cases, move to a TC3 or a hinge. And you have flexion extension mismatch. Uh, I've already told you that a valgus is an extension problem. But if you have laxity, even in flexion, or you have flexion extension mismatch because of your releases, again, you need to do a hinge. So these are some of the patients that we, we did. These are uh, cases that I've done with the robot. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, so here you can see this lady 
uh, with a very severe valgus uh, on the left and right. We've done the staggered and she's doing well. So this is a more of a type two valgus where you have MCL is also uh, lax, but still firm. Uh, and you have medial pathology. Again, we've used the robot. And uh, this is uh, these are the x-rays of this particular patient. On the right side, the nail was removed uh, and rods on both sides because bone quality was very poor. And uh, here on the lateral side also, the one that uh, the case that you've seen, uh, you've used uh, rods on both sides. So take home message, valgus is an extension problem. Clinical radiographic assessment, very important. You should know whether it's correctable or not, whether your MCL is intact or not, whether you have associated FFD or hyperextension, whether patella is maltracking or not, any neurological deficit. Use medial parapetellar except in fixed valgus, stiff knees with maltracking patella. Always take TBI at 90 degrees. Take three to five degrees of valgus in the femur. Rotate your femur adequately. If you have an extension tightness, address your PCL or the IT band. IT band is more easy to release with a 11 number blade. But you have to do the posterior lateral corner. Sorry, there is a spelling mistake there. If you, the posterior lateral corner has to be addressed if you have an associated FFP. After doing both releases, if you have some amount of radial valgus, you need to do a lateral condylar osteotomy. And then if your patella is maltracking, you will have to add a rattle rectangular release. PS is the most common implant. And I've already told you specific indications where you need to use a hinge versus where you need to use a CR. So that's the end of my presentation. I just stop sharing. Okay. So. Yeah, wonderful. Uh... So, us, very well done. Sir. Both I salute, compliment Thanks. both Vivian and you for taking so much of uh, uh, pain. Uh, I don't say pain, the effort, because uh, telling Valgus team we can do it in 15 minutes, but the way you guys showed uh, the videos and the line diagrams is really commendable. That is the, that shows the passion for teaching. And the best way to, to learn is to teach. Good. Okay, yes. guys. Yeah, chat box, open the questions. Yes, sir. So yeah. in chat box, um, oh, how, to be sh how to be sure that I'm not going through LCL while releasing that uh, IT band? Yeah, okay. so uh, LCL is an extra articular structure. So it is outside the joint. So when you're using a 11 number plate, what you're actually feeling is the IT band. A lot of uh, times we think that it is the lateral collateral ligament, but it is not. So if you use the 11 number blade, either go parallel or go right angle, and you just do minus tab incisions, there's no way you will uh, release the lateral collateral ligament. Another important thing is uh, by palpating, if you go further down, the thick card goes further down towards the fibular head and that is the LCL. So LCL is never close to the joint, it is away and down. That is another point. And I think wherever you got an access, I would advise the youngsters to go to the, your anatomy college days or pathology museum and see the dissected knee, if it is possible. There are specimens and the posterior lateral corner is very difficult unless you're an arthroscopic surgeon. You should know which structure is going from where. Once you do see the proper pathology specimen, confusion. If possible, try to do that. Very, very important. So even between uh, postural corner and IT band, when you start feeling these two structures, uh, when you uh, palpate them, you'll clearly know which is tighter. So if you have, if you're confused, uh, it's called the a la carte approach. So. If you feel posterior lateral corner is tighter than the IT band, address that. If you, in this particular patient where you saw the video, the posterior lateral corner was not tight at all. It was all coming from the IT band. So I just did release of the IT band. Another important thing is to use the laminar spreader. You have to have a laminar spreader with a end button or a, like a biscuit. There are laminar spreaders where the end is like a circular oval. So buy them. And if you are con concerned with uh, the softness of the tibia, as Suhas 
uh, said, you can put a broad osteotome on the top of the tibia and then put the lamina spreader on the top of the osteotome. That is another technique. So that you won't dig into the bone. You got my point? The, yeah. the broad, broad osteotome goes from anterior to posterior. That means it will sit on the cortical rim. And then you put the lamina spreader on the top of that. Then it won't dig. But lamina Great spreader point. is the must because under vision, under palpation, you have to cut. No blind cuts. Sir, next question. Uh, in most cases of TKR virus or valgus, do you prefer CR system or PS in general? For all practical purposes, PS. Yeah. CR if... is still done. I do CRs. Ashok Rajagopal does CRs. But for all of you, do not have any confusion. Make the life simple. Go for PS. Yeah, and it all depends on how you train also. If uh, you've uh, trained where your, your uh, mentors used CR and your uh, used to it, uh, might, uh, you have freedom to use CR. It's, so it's entirely a surgeon's preference. But you should use a system where there is a vision for uh, extension rod on both sides. That is very important. Number two, you can pick up a system where the box cut is minimal. So for example, Max is minimal bone cut. Buccal Papas is minimal bone cut. In fact, PFC is a, a wrong implant for uh, rheumatoid valgus knees. Because it's a massive bone cut, uh, box yeah. cut. Box. Sir, is there any difference between intra-articular and extra-articular lateral release? Uh, there is nothing. So I do routinely inside out. As far as I've shown you, outside in. Uh, inside out uh, looks much more easier, in fact. And uh, so, in fact, inside out, you don't need to even come out. Sometimes just inside fibers, under vision, you can cut also. That again depends on your training, but no much difference. Yeah, even IT band can be done from the outside. Uh, Leo Whiteside has a great uh, video on that, uh, where he exposes the whole thing and then just completely transects the IT band. Uh, but that requires more dissection. So um, posterolateral corner IT band, it's best done from inside. But lateral retinacular release, like how sir said, either you can do it from the inside or the outside. So as what happens if the IT band is completely transected? Are you concerned? Um, if my IT band completely opens up, but I still have lateral collateral and popliteus intact, and my lateral is not opening much, I'll just go ahead with a PS. But yeah, what if... is IT band transaction doesn't make any big difference. Yeah. So. Okay, do... but... But if you, don't you have, it, yeah. if you have more than three to four mm of opening, then you start thinking about CCK. So after lateral right. epicondyl osteotomy and tibial tibial osteotomy, any difference in post-op rehabilitation? So uh, lateral epicondyl or osteotomy, uh, there is absolutely nothing. Uh, in fact, Giles Kadari does a, just a sliver and he just leaves it there and they also have equal rehab. Uh, but in terms of TTO, you want that to heal. So we would put them in a straight leg knee brace for at least uh, two to three weeks uh, and then start a range of motion. But if you do a TTO, which is also like a sliver where you don't use any screws and you tie it with an IT band, you can right away start rehab. So, uh, two questions. Just a point. Uh, while we have stressed a lot on the lateral approach, and sir has beautifully shown the videos, and then you've spoken a lot about the osteotomy. For all practical purposes, in your even in your clinics, you will notice that ninety nine percent of your valgus knees are actually correctable, and you don't need to go to the lateral approach. And if at all you are going to go for the lateral approach, take someone who has an experience in that before you attempt any of these procedures, either a TTO or a lateral uh, epicondyl osteotomy or a lateral approach uh, as it is. So the good news is that even if it's uh, most of these are uh, lax on the, uh, sorry, most of these are correctable deformities, the valgus knees, very stiff and non-correctable. Only then you need to think of all these uh, advanced procedures. Yeah, so, Kushal yes. got the point right. 
అన్లైక్ వెస్ట్రన్ కంట్రీస్ ఇంగ్లాండ్ ఆల్మోస్ట్ మోర్ దాన్ ఫిఫ్టీ పర్సెంట్ ఆర్ ఫిక్స్ వాల్యూస్ బట్ ఇన్ ఇండియన్ పాపులేషన్ ఐ డోంట్ నో వై ది మోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ దెమ్ ఆర్ కరెక్ట్ కరెక్టబుల్ వాల్యూస్ యాజ్ గుడ్ ఆర్ యాజ్ ఈజీ యాజ్ so as as scary as the whole presentation would have sounded and look because it's so new and unfamiliar yeah. the valgus ni don't be so scared of it if it it will be correctable most of the times and you can proceed with your uh, normal medial parapetalar approach and just the principles that uh, swas sir outlined if you stick to those it's pretty simple pretty simple it's very rare to come across uh, all these videos in one yeah. single presentation so we try to compile everything so that you know what is the sequence in which things start uh, but point well taken 95% of the times uh, you can just get away with a medial parapetal approach so so next question sir in post traumatic arthritis in both medial and lateral side defect how to decide the level of tibial cut so usually uh, that is a very rare situation either you have a varus uh, or uh, a valgus uh and you have the uh, liberty to uh, measure from either side we usually may measure from the normal side but if you have a defect which is like that then uh, it's it's uh, whatever normal bone that is left anteriorly you will have to measure from there or even otherwise uh, all that you have to do is you put the jig in use an angel wing uh, and see how much you're cutting okay and then how much you want to cut is based on uh how gross the deformity is uh if you have a very lax knee you would cut less if you have a very tight knee i would take probably just plus 2 but not more than that because so many osteophytes are still there posteriorly anteriorly so there's always wisdom in taking less cut to begin with uh and then progress uh do your distal femur and then if you feel your gaps are still tight then take little more tibia yeah absolutely you can't undo a big cut but you can uh, recut a conservative cut so Thank when you it out like that you can start with a conservative cut sir yesterday i have assisted one case with the uh, varus knee with a lateral side defect post traumatic so yeah. that's why i am asking so, the reason okay. is uh, both in hto post hto as well post- as post traumatic uh, you can uh, the pathology is very variable like for example if you do an open uh, uh open wedge hto uh, you can end up with a valgus knee uh, where you have a complete tilt you have patella baha with mcl laxity but if somebody does a closed uh, uh lateral closing wedge then you end up with a very tight valgus so you'll have to deal with whatever pathology you have at hand in case of lateral tibial plateau widening because of that trauma how to size that tibia accurately because we decide that tibial size based on that lateral border and yeah so uh, usually what happens is uh, there is some line of demarcation between the normal bone and the osteophyte so you'll have to look for that little more exposure on that side uh, you can remove the osteophyte and that it will give you a like even in my patient uh, the one that i did i have still have some lateral bone left in that particular case but it didn't uh, go behind it because i was so well balanced so why do you want to uh, in terms of uh, releases if you do that then again the knee becomes unstable so if major part of uh, the tibia is covered well uh, with your implant you don't have to worry sir how does patella alta or patella baha affect the management of valgus any changes in surgery steps uh so usually uh, patella baha in a valgus knee is a post hto setting no no bother about you do it patella and baha there is nothing much you can do just stick to the basics that's all in the revision scenario sometimes patella will be touching the the lower part of the tibia the x-rays look so horrendous but yeah. nothing will happen don't worry about that you try to maintain the joint line
Yeah. So if but if you're hell bent on correcting Patla Baha, then TTO has to be done, and you'll have to move it up. Yes. So they are asking out of uh, not related to today's topic. Any experience and precautions for use of Journey to BCS Oxygenium TKR? Is this system need more than nine mm proximal DPL cut? So Journey to, if I uh, if I remember, it is the anatomic uh, knee, right? Where uh, the the varus is built into the polyethylene. Uh, I would say all your cuts uh, are the same, but how you put your femur and how you remove it, uh, it's uh, technically a little more challenging. So you'll have to just get used to how you bag your femur in and how you take it out. Um, so whole idea is because conventional surgery it is so difficult to give a varus uh, in your cut. Uh, Journey two has developed varus within the poly, so you Which cut one? your tibia, yeah. Yeah. but uh, the varus is built into the poly tibia. So I would just do a simple TKR, but the only issue is uh, how you put your femur in. So normally this is how you insert your femur, right? In this particular case, uh, you'll have to insert it uh, flexed and then lift it up. Hyperflexion. Uh, so there are some questions asked in the starting of the class. Any conditions we not we may not be able to separate capsule from retinaculum? Uh, I would only foresee in very bad rheumatoids where uh, the tissues are so thinned out uh, that you are unable to. So especially in somebody like this, <laughs> where uh, uh, the knee is so tiny, the patient was also so tiny. So demarticating these structures would be difficult. In if you face a situation like that, just do medial parapetal. So, uh, even in even in this case, I think uh, Dr. Kushal operated on the right. Uh, they had uh, issues with the how thin the the whole uh, lateral side was. Yeah. I'll just add a few points as I was listening to uh, Dr. Vibian sir and Dr. Suhas. Um, so first thing is knee alignment, like very loosely. Uh, this concept is we all have a normal five to seven degree valgus. That's that's a statement that comes across. Knee has a five to seven degree valgus. It's not like that. It's the femur anatomical axis and the uh, tibial anatomical axis that have that valgus angle. But all our knees are straight. Otherwise, we would all be in the uh, type 1 of Ranavat. We are not because type 1 is less than 10 degrees. So, please ha have that very clear. Valgus deformity means mechanical axis of femur to mechanical axis of tibia. And the one that's loosely used is the anatomical axis, that angle. Okay. So, that's the first point. None of, none of us are in valgus. We are all straight. First point. Second point is in the Ranavat classification, type 3 is more than 20 degree and MCL uh, uh, I mean, uh, absent, deficient. Yeah. So it, don't don't correlate it so directly. Okay. We have severe deformities where the MCL is very much intact. In fact, none of the valgus deformities that I have done or I have seen in our institute have had a completely absent MCL. They have may have been 15, 20, 30 degree, 40 degree valgus deformities. But the moment you start the procedure, you know that okay, there is some tissue there on the medial side. So you might just need to do a uh, a TC3 kind of in, implant, okay, a constrained implant. You don't need to go to a hinge. So that classification, be careful. More the deformity, MCL is gone. Asa nahi hai. It's just stretched. So you need just need to balance it out. Uh, the second, the third point is uh, valgus correction angle. Uh, you'll be tempted to move up from five degree to seven degree because if you just draw it on a paper or if you just see it. If you move upwards from 5 degree, the lateral side, which is tight, the that part gets cut more. So your distal lateral uh, condyle of the femur will get cut more and it's easier to balance if you move upwards from 5 to 7 degree. But that is not at all recommended. Either you stay at 5 or go down to 3. Uh, and Dr. Thomas has already explained that concept. Yeah, because right. you will look uncorrected. Correct. If you put a 7 degree valgus. Yes. It will almost look like you haven't corrected the deformity. So patients will be unhappy. Yeah. So even if you don't cut that uh, lateral side, 
when you put in a 3 degree valgus correction angle take that uh, you can do a plus 2 cut but you take that uh, and then add a cement or cement with screw and fill up that space okay yeah. so uh, don't go to anything upwards of 5 7 8 and all that don't do that and uh, one of the techniques that is uh, actually pretty easy is um, in correctable valgus and most of our knees are correctable valgus you finished your tibial cut so you don't know whether to take uh, two, three, four, five degrees of valgus. You don't know what exactly to take. So uh, in extension, give traction to your uh, tibia, or to your leg, and uh, put in a spacer block on the roof of your cut tibia. And then just draw a parallel line on the distal femur. <clears throat> so in a way, you're grossly seeing where the uh, distal cut is going to be parallel to your tibial cut. And then you match it to your... Uh, the valgus correction angle so five four three degrees then you can match it so you don't need to be fixated with in one particular angle you can go ahead with this technique as well so tbl cut is done make uh, give traction to the limb and put in a spacer there and make a draw a line on the distal surface which is parallel to your tbl cut that will automatically give you your correction angle okay so that is only in uh, correctable valgus cases and again, in all these cases, whether it's uh, matching extension or flexion, as in Dr. Vibian's presentation also, make sure that whenever you assess the parallelity of uh, a cut that you're going to do, there's a traction and the joint is in tension. You know, a lot of times we keep the knee in 90 degree. And then if you're trying to go for a, a flexion gap assessment and you do it without tensing the knee, that will be a spurious uh, assessment. So just make sure that your thigh is lifted and your leg is pulled down and your knee is tense before you assess whether a gap is trapezoidal or uh, rectangular. And uh, the last thing is, yeah, the constraint level, the decision of constraint level, whether you want to do a PS or a uh, higher constraint, a PC3 kind of a virus valgus constraint implant is intra-op. Okay, don't uh, jump to it pre-op that I am going to hinge it. Not like that. Uh, some cases like uh, Dr. Suha said in this last slide and Dr. VBN towards the end, they mentioned about the neurovascular disorders and the completely deficient MCLs. All okay, but most of these will not be like that. So most of your valgus knees, as the trialing is approached, you will know whether uh, there is that um, laxity in extension which will then determine whether you need to hire, go for a higher constraint. MDQ constraint. <laughs> so these are just, yeah. Yeah. If you have to be very clinical about valgus correction angle, you have to do a long leg film, measure your anatomic axis, mechanical axis, calculate because it can be as low as 3 and as high as uh, uh, 11. And somebody is asked, can we do a, a 0 degree valgus correction angle? Now that we've done uh, so many studies on phenotyping uh, patients, and now we know that not everybody has valgus. Uh, we also have con constitutional virus with a uh, apex proximal joint line, where uh, you don't have valgus, but you have virus on the femur. So that is also possible. Uh, it does exist, but though in maybe less than 10% of our patients, number one, Phenotype is constitutional virus with an apex distal joint line where your LDFA is, is valgus. But you do have situations where it is in virus. So if you want to be uh, very close to matching the patient's phenotype, then you have to do long leg film, calculate your LDFA, MPTA, and try to recreate it with or without the aid of technology like robotic. I got I think uh, that sums up the session. Any question, please leave in the chat. Uh, anybody in the yes, packet do you want to add question, anything? Oh, sure. Elderly lady with obesity with yeah. large thighs, valgus correction angle, should we decrease it to prevent rubbing of thighs while walking? Yeah, yes, this we covered. Uh, we said <laughs> put in a the... bit of virus. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but know the consequence uh, of that. Right. Uh, Fellows, uh, again, as per my request last week, please enroll for the East meeting in April. You will enjoy that. And early bird offer is there. 
for you there is a special uh, this thing sir sir so how do they do that they should get in touch with the ratnagar yes sir sure? yes sir they can get, yeah. get in touch with ratnagar sir ratnagar sir he will send the link to them send the link and uh, there is a special tariff for you and the accommodation is very limited and it is uh, quite far from the city ramoji film city so please come with your spouses but register early so that you will get the accommodation there on the site it's a wonderful conference you will enjoy like anything especially after this exhaustive fellowship course immediately in april you will come and see the masters in action so it is a great opportunity don't miss it so please join okay yeah yes, good so next week thank you so much swas we be in tk here in uh, no. ffd and recurvatum sir recurvatum right good so wonderful thank you so much thank you sir good night thank you sir. Good night. okay bye guys Thank you, sir. Good night.